it's now 6 p.m. so I guess it's on that borderline where good afternoon is a little bit too late. It's probably now good evening. Um, today is the Sunday, the 28th of May, um, 2017. Um, my name is Jared. I am a crocheter, a knitter, a weaver, a sewer. I'm from originally from Salford in the northwest of England but now living in Abingdon, seven miles south of Oxfordshire, in Oxfordshire in the UK. Sorry, seven miles south of the city of Oxford in Oxfordshire. Um, it's been very, very warm over the last few days. Um, it, fortunately, the temperatures do seem to be cooling down a little now, but I'm, I'm not very good with high temperatures. Um, I'm, prefer the, the late evening on, on days like this where it's just about cooling down to a normal bearable level but um, having said that I hope you can hear the wonderful bird song in the background it's very nice to hear it um, it's a little bit um, more overcast today than it has been but uh, I don't think it's affected how hot it's getting <laughs> so it, it is beginning to cool a little now so that's good um, I've had a busy old time in the last week. Um, I do have two, yes, not one, but two finished objects. Kind of. <laughs> so, having having made a wonderful announcement, I'll now take it all back. The first finished object is actually on the wall behind me. And it is my first ever quilt. Um, I hope you can see the, the crocheted uh, bunting that I made previously. Um, and it has its border and it's been quilted. I, I'll, I'll give you a closer look at one of the squares. You can see that the squares have been, uh, the triangles rather, have had the, um, a quarter inch seam or quarter inch stitching within each of the triangles. Um, I finished that at the beginning of the week and it was interesting making it. Um, it's not perfect by a long chalk. Uh, it is, as I say, the first quilt that I've made and was experimental because um, I was trying to understand the techniques that I've seen so many videos from, particularly the Missouri Star Quilt Company, Jenny Doan, whom I mentioned last week. Um, I think the Yes, there are, there are lots of mistakes within it, and I know exactly which mistakes they are, and I know exactly why they happen. And actually, that's the important part of, of all of this crafting. Um, if everybody could do it the first time they picked something up, then that would be fine, but the, there'd be no sense of achievement in that. Um, I do know exactly where I went wrong with that quilt, and I know exactly how to put it right when I make my next one, and then one after that, and the one after that, so they will increasingly be better quality, um, fewer imperfections, but at the same time, the imperfections, as well as being opportunities for me to learn what I need to learn, are also what make that quilt unique, along with the fabric choices and everything else. There is literally not another one like it in the world, and that's one of the nice things about handmade as opposed to factory made, where hundreds of things are churned out over and over and over again looking exactly the same as each other so um, yeah I'm quite pleased with that I think I'm, I'm displaying it for the time being um, I don't think I'll be giving it away I quite like the colours and I quite like the effect um, but I don't think it's of a quality that I would want to give it to somebody so for the time being at least it's going to remain on the wall and may remain there for quite a long time um, I've stuck it up, not using pins, but um, they're sticky pads. You peel off the backing of both sides, double-sided, and they just peel off the wall and peel off the fabric when they're finished, so there's no long-term effect of, of them being on the wall. Um, and my second finished object, kind of, is the butterfly shawl that I've been making for a colleague and friend who is um, leaving us uh, in two weeks' time. Um, and this this is the shawl, um, and I hope you can see that within, I think you can, you can see the butterflies. Um, there's one here, and that whole row of going across where they're, they're white and, and teal. 
And they're wonderful colours, and she really likes the colours. I've not blocked this yet, so it's um, it, it will be much more spread out. And I think once you spread it out more, then the butterflies become much more noticeable. Um, so it will be blocked when it's completely finished. The reason I'm not sure, I've, I've still got it attached to the working yarn, and I've only got a small amount left. But I do have enough left for at least one more row across the top. Um, I stopped making the butterflies at this row here. You can see the tops of these butterflies. So that's the last row. Um, and <laughs> I've been following a pattern which was written entirely in Russian, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, and I haven't entirely followed it religiously because I, I didn't like one, of, or I wanted to more regularise some of the um, patterns within the shawl. But I've effective overall, and particularly the butterfly motif, is very much as the pattern. Um, and that pattern, I do, do know, finished off with two rows above the last butterfly of the granny stitch, which is this three treble crochets and two chain space motif going all the way across. And I've done that two rows, but I do have enough yarn left for at least another, if not two more rows. So I'm in two minds as to whether or not to create a significantly bigger border. Now, my only hesitation is I haven't really got a big border around. I mean, there is this um, if, lace effect along the sides here that you can see. Um, the butterflies all start quite a way in from the edge, in fact. So I could justify, but I've not decided, so I will decide, but it's it's effectively finished, I just have to decide whether or not to do that. So I hope to have that finished, well, tonight I'll, I'll have it finished and hopefully blocked as, as well. Um, and then I'll be able to give it to her on Monday when I'm back in work. Um, so that's my two kind of finished objects, mainly. And I would, just staying on the finished objects, <coughs> I, I used, I began a different shawl with that yarn. I began a knitting a lace shawl. Um, and I and I ripped it and actually made that one instead, partly because I prefer the uh, motif of the butterfly, and I think that's a very beautiful motif um, to give to somebody as a gift. Um, I also, I, 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 mean, I am doing some knitting, but I, I think, on the whole, if I can crochet something rather than knit it, I think I'll always prefer crocheting. I, I know I've not given knitting as much time and energy as I have given crochet in the past because of being off work last year and therefore having a lot more time on my hands. But there's something about crocheting which I find... I find I understand it better. I, f I feel um, I'm, in, I'm more in control of what's happening with, with knitting. Because I've, fundamentally the difference I think between knitting and crocheting is with crochet you make each stitch and it's a standalone item. You, you make it into another stitch but it's in itself it is completed when you have finished that stitch. With knitting, you knit a longer row, and then you knit back, and you knit along the row, and you knit back. And it's only by... The, the stitches are actually completed within the row, rather than in themselves. I don't know if I'm explaining that very clearly. One of the reasons knitting is preferred as a, as a material for fabric, uh, for clothing, um, is because it's less dense. And it's less dense because each individual stitch is more connected. It's connected below and to the side and above and to the next side. So it's actually more connected on all four sides. And in some ways crochet is like that, but, but the individual crochet stitch will stand by itself. 
and then is connected to another individual stitch that stands by itself and is created by itself. Um, so you do get a, a thicker fabric, but you also have a more, for me, a more satisfying process. Um, because I, I, if I make a mistake within a row of knitting, that's not too bad to be able to go back and put that mistake right. But if that mistake is in a row further down, or if a, a stitch gets dropped and, and it starts to run down, it's very difficult to put that back. It is possible, and I have done it with one thing that I've been knitting, but I find it a little... I suppose it's more technical um, in one way, because it... it it requires more artistry, and maybe I'm just not at the level of artistry that I should be at to enjoy knitting as much. Um, having said that, I, I really enjoy the knitting that I've got for the um, the couple of jackets, uh, cardigans and vests that I'm making. So, at this stage though, I, I, I had noticed that I have a preponderance of crochet over knitting and I think that's likely to continue. I think I will first and foremost be and always be a crocheter. Um, whether that's because that's the first thing I came to or whether it's because it is just the craft that speaks to me most, that, that, that accomplishes most what I want to accomplish and accomplishes it without as much effort or difficulty. Whatever the reason may be, I think crochet is always going to be my first love and my go-to craft. If I can't do it in crochet, then I'll do it in something else. Um, that may change, but uh, at the moment, that's certainly where I am. I won't be giving up on the knitting. I'm enjoying knitting socks and, as I say, knitting these cardigans and vests that I'm knitting. But I think for most projects, I will probably stick with the crochet. Um, but we'll see, as I say, and it, it, all these things are subject to change and it may just be that the particular projects I've wanted to do <laughs> lend themselves to crochet more than they do to knitting um, and that may change as time goes by. So, keep an open mind. So, um, I've not got any further with any of my other whips, uh, works in progress. Um, I am where I was with the dungarees which but now I've finished the shawl I will be able to give some time to finishing off those granny squares and I'm, I'm more than halfway through making them so it's just a case of finish them off and then I can start sewing them together and having the more completed object um, in my hands. Um, so I'll move on to acquisitions and I have actually genuinely been very good this week despite temptation and provocation by Wendy. Yes Wendy I am talking to you no, I didn't go to Mason's on Friday when I was off. I have more than enough to be getting on with and more than enough stuff to get on with it with, as it were. I really, 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 really don't need any more things at the moment. <sighs> but having said that, I have bought some things, but then they're, they're more useful things than anything else. Um, what I didn't mention last week, and I think I can show it hanging, I'm, I'm sitting behind the camera so it will be, yes, uh, there we are, on the wall next to the wardrobe there is hanging a new cutting mat, it's much bigger than my other cutting mat, um, sorry that wasn't particularly, <laughs> but you know, it's as good as it needs to be, um, so that's, I bought that last week when I was at, um, uh, Hobbycraft and forgot to mention it and I was rightly reprimanded for failing to mention it so I've mentioned it now um, and hanging on this wall is a series of baskets which are hanging from the um, curtain pole and within them I've put some bits and pieces from crocheting magazines um, so that's all my kits and things that are just waiting for me to get going and I popped to Ikea with um, Bob and Wendy yesterday, which was very nice. 
Um, and we had a very nice breakfast there. It's a bit too early in the day for meatballs, sadly, but there we go. Um, and I bought a few things. Um, first was these little plastic pods. I, this is actually the... I bought a rail and, and four of these, as you can see, they've got hangers. Four of these hang in a, ra a row on the wall. And I, this is the crocheting... Uh, the, the yarn I'm crocheting the dungarees from, so I got one of each colour in a different pot. And it's within pulling distance of where I'd be sitting to crochet them so that it keeps them off the ground, so that's quite nice. Um, and they're on the wall behind. And I, I got the hanging basket from there as well, the which I think is actually crocheted itself. It's quite nice, but... Um, I also bought two inners for cushions, and Wendy bought the same things and has advised me that they're very thin, so although they're 20 by 20, probably the cushion covers themselves should only be 16 by 16 to allow it to be a plump and full cushion. So I'll take her advice on that, um, because she's already uh, made one cushion cover with hers. Um, the other significant item I bought was actually in the um, bargain basement, as it were, next to the checkout, and it, it was actually a tablecloth. Um, it's a rather attractive tablecloth, but I would never use it as a tablecloth. Um, it's this lovely material which goes from yellow through turquoise into purples, with, with red accents and blue accents, and then back that way. Um, more significantly, it's 100% cotton, and it's an untreated, it's not, it's not been coated with plastic or anything, so it's about one and a half by two and a half metres, which for five pounds, that amount of 100% cotton fabric, I think, is an extremely good deal. I'm going to be making the two cushion covers from that fabric um, as my first um, major project uh, for sewing and of, of June and I think pretty much that's it. I have bought one or two other things but they're not of any significance or consequence. They're, they're little bits and pieces of for around the house which will be very useful. Um, so there has been one, <laughs> I've been very good so far, I've not mentioned this. I've had a, a very difficult time at work in the last month or so, two months really. Um, difficult only in the sense that I've had to do some quite unpleasant work that's taken long hours and has had consequences for other people which are not pleasant. Um, it's part and parcel of my work unfortunately but it's not something, although you in it's possible to enjoy the satisfaction of doing the job well. It's not possible to enjoy the, the outcomes because of the effect they have on other people in their lives. Um, but having said that, I did a good job and I did work hard and I did show my worth and I'm very pleased with that fact that you know I was able to um, deal with the situation in hand several situations in hand and come out on top as it were in that I performed as well as I want to be able to perform and so I decided to treat myself <laughs> and I decided I wanted to learn to play the banjo. I love bluegrass music ever since my father showed me um, I think it was, is it Deliverance? Yes, Deliverance is the movie um, not the whole movie because that it's quite a dark movie in many respects, but <clears throat> the particular scene was dueling banjos, where um, one of the main characters is playing his guitar in competition with uh, uh, one of the rednecks playing his banjo, and it's a, it's a fantastic tune, it's a fantastic um, interaction between two musicians as well. Um, and I've always loved it, and I've, I like bluegrass as well, um, more generally and have started to, um, there are two particular bluegrass groups at the moment, there's 
who are not, neither of them from that kind of Appalachian redneck country of the Deep South, the poverty-stricken area of America. Um, one group is from Finland, and they are Stephen and Steve and Seagulls, which is meant to sound like Steven Seagal. Um, and they uh, they famously on YouTube have a video bluegrass music video of um, ACDC's Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck? I think it's Thunderstruck. I always want to say Thunder Road for some reason, but it's Thunderstruck. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible at... Anyway. And the other group is a group of um, three brothers from New Jersey, or New Jersey. Uh, I, I, again, not particularly redneck country, and certainly not part of the Appalachian tradition, but they... they Eldest brother plays the guitar, the middle brother is does the vocals and lead vocals and plays the violin, and the youngest brother plays the banjo, and they're called Sleeker Man Banjo Boys, and the reason for that is because when the little boy was only eight and picked up his first banjo, it was so heavy that he had to lie on his back to play it, and he used to close his eyes as he played, and hence Sleeker Man, which I thought was a... It's a cool name for a band, I think. And they, they they play traditional stuff, but they also write their own more modern versions of bluegrass. And it's really... I'm really enjoying that. So I decided I wanted to learn to play the banjo. And I have been looking at a particular banjo on um, Amazon... And this week, uh, our employee benefit scheme actually gave us 5% off e-vouchers on Amazon, which is extremely good. And so I decided to buy the vouchers and buy myself a banjo. And this is the, um, this is the bag. Rocket Music is the name of the manufacturer. It's a very nice um, gig bag for the banjo to go in. And this is the banjo. And it is a beautiful instrument. I mean... Even just the instrument as itself, um, sorry, the bridge isn't quite straight. I've, I've um, had to put the bridge in myself and then tune it, which I've done. That bridge is not quite straight. It is now. That's better. Um, and this is it. Um, it's a five-string banjo. I cannot play the banjo at all. I've bought a book to go with it, Banjo for Absolute Beginners. And I've bought my uh, picks here. Um, I have tuned it, so I had to put the bridge in. And which is it's a lovely sound. I love the sound. It's it's all based around, unlike guitars, which are wooden, or violins and violas and cellos and ba double basses. This is actually effectively a drum. It's used to be vellum, it's now plastic skin stretched tight over a drum face and then the bridge is what transmits the sound into and which um, amplifies it using the and that's what gives it that unique sound. Also, which I didn't realise, I used to play the violin when I was very young um, for a while and I didn't realise the five strings, the f those four go up, as you'd expect, but the highest string is actually the f at this end. So you start, you start high and then go to the lowest in that order, which is, I don't know why, um, it seems to, it, it, it's unusual, it's, it's peculiar to the banjo to have the highest string on that side, I believe. But so be it, that's the way it is. Um, and that one gets tightened further down, halfway down the handle. Or, or neck or stem or whatever they call this. Um, it is a beautiful instrument though. I mean, just looking at it in itself, it is beautiful. So I'm really looking forward to learning how to play that. Which I will do over time. Um, like everything else, it takes time to learn anything new. and. It taking time to learn is not a reason not to do it, frankly. Um, and I'm quite looking forward to it. I, I, I enjoy music. I've 
I enjoy listening to music and I enjoy m making music. I one of the one of the things that uh, was said to me when I was off sick last year, um, when I went in for my uh, occupational health sessions at work. Those are the three main picks. Um, several people said to me, it's, it's not the same without me around because nobody sings in the corridors. And I hadn't really thought about it. And it was actually something somebody else mentioned yesterday. Um, I do tend to sing an awful lot. Um, and I just enjoy music. Um, I'm not a great singer. I've never pretended to be a great singer. I'm not a great musician, but I enjoy, pretty much like with other things, I enjoy the process involved in, in making sounds. And and the music in particular is known, uh, is, is rightly understood to be the most expressive form of art in that it not only speaks to you of the emotion, but it actually engenders that emotion within you. So happy sounds make us happy, sad sounds make us sad. So they don't just represent that sadness to us, they actually make us feel that sadness, much more intensely than any other art form does. Um, so I think that's going to um, be... Uh, any, I, I, I pity my poor neighbours for the next few months. <laughs> um, uh, maybe forever if they hate Bendra music, but... Um, I'm quite looking forward to acquiring a new skill. Um, I'm not a performer, I will never be a performer, and I doubt if I'll ever play the banjo for you. Um, but I am in, I am looking forward to getting going with the first lesson once I've uploaded this video today. Um, and if I can, I will put in a little bit of deliverance, or, or the dueling banjos rather, um, if there is a, um, is, if there's not a right violation because obviously YouTube don't like people using copyrighted music in, in their videos and, and I wouldn't want to violate somebody's copyright so um, I will have a look and see if I can find a, a, a non-rights version for you in case you're not familiar with it. Right, um, that's basically everything in terms of the acquisitions, in, in terms of crafts. So, yesterday I didn't record this video because in the morning I was out at Ikea with um, Bob and Wendy and our, one of our neighbours, our friends, Lizzie, and I didn't get back until lunchtime, half past twelve, and then at four o'clock I went out again with Bob and Wendy to Oxford because um, there was a reunion of um, former and current workers at the Oxford Bus Company, which is my employer. And it was really, we had a really good evening. It was, it was nice to catch up with some old faces. You know, I've been working there for 17 years, so, or the best part of. Um, and so there were lots of people that I knew for a period and who then moved on or retired. And it was nice to see and catch up with them. And we had a really enjoyable evening. Um, so I didn't get home until about nine-ish, uh, nine, nine-thirty, which is not too late. Um, it was quite good. <laughs> but obviously it was too late to then record something. And um, I have been doing bits and pieces around the place and finishing off the shawl today and obviously waiting for uh, the Amazon man to deliver uh, my parcel which came this afternoon and then setting the banjo up and, and just admiring it for its beauty as much as anything else so I'd, I've not really had much time before today really and I wanted to record today so that you've got it um, I, I'm, I'm trying not to let the weekly schedule slip unless there is a pressing reason why I can't, as there has been in the last few weeks. Um, so I, I want to, I don't want to get heavy in this podcast, but this week has been a significant week in Britain for a couple of reasons. 
Um, I come from Salford, city of Salford in Lancashire, which is uh, a city that borders onto the city of Manchester. Um, the city centre of Manchester and the, the historic city centre of Salford are less than a mile apart from each other. Uh, Salford Cathedral and Manchester Cathedral are on the same road, um, <laughs> on the A6, one on either side of the river. Um, so what happened at the Manchester Evening News Arena um, on Monday night has affected the whole country. And Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth rightly described it as a barbaric, wicked and evil act in uh, various uh, reported comments that she made while visiting the victims. And I don't think there is anybody really who couldn't agree to that. But I've been very proud of the city, um, the way it's responded to the violence and not let it determine the response, that ordinary people have just been supportive, that the... I was aware from an, my family, my mother's house is about a mile from Manchester City Centre, um, along Bury New Road, the A56, and lots of the rest of my family live in and around there, and in fact, I believe my nieces were due to be going to a concert there in the next couple of weeks, so it could easily have been there on Monday. They weren't, and no, none of my family were in any way directly involved in this incident, but I was aware that people were quite nervous and afraid on Tuesday and Wednesday and upset and angry and all the expected human emotions. But then we had the vigil, which was a, a wonderful, positive response. We've had Manchester United winning the Europa League and the, the, the uplift to the city that that gave. Um, we've had other events in the city and people have shown their willingness not to let this incident stop them from living their lives. And today we've had the Manchester run and there were literally thousands of people taking part and literally thousands of people lining the route. Those people themselves knowing that if they went they would then be another target if another depraved individual wanted to carry out such a barbaric, wicked and evil act. But they're not letting other people determine how they live their lives. They are acting as free individuals in a democratic society, and that's to be applauded. Another important event that happened in the last week or so was the death of a significant criminal, um, Ian Brady. Um, his crimes had a massive impact in their day and continue to be understood to be almost uniquely terrible. Um, even, even when other serious abuse of children has come to light, it still pales into insignificance to this particular man's crime. And it's been very interesting to observe the unequivocation to describe both the Manchester Bomber and Ian Brady as wicked, evil, barbaric, depraved. And they are. Even as we know that the Manchester Bomber um, was isolated from his society, from his community, was on the edge of his community as a petty criminal, as a person involved in extremist ideology who felt not part of the mainstream as even as we know that Ian Brady was treated for most of his time in prison as a patient in hospital in a secure hospital for the criminally insane as it were because of his disorders and we don't let that fact the fact that there may have been 
psychological failings within mm. the two individuals take away from the fact that they then took that extra st- step. And I, I, this made me think because there's been a lot of um, morally confused pop culture in the last 20 years. Not immoral to the point, and fantastically, I mean, they are fantastical figures. I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the musical Wicked, or um, the kind of Suicide Squad, that's the film, where somehow even people, characters, that we know to be evil, like the Wicked Witch of the West, um, in The Wizard of Oz, there is no equivocation. In the L. Frank Baum books, there is no equivocation. She is the embodiment of everything that is evil. But somehow the musical Wicked and that whole tries to give an explanation, and this is about female liberation, and this is about identity and all the rest of it. Well, no, it's not. It's about depravity and wickedness and barbarity. And there is no equivocation there. And I just wonder sometimes whether... And this is a half-formed thought, really. I just wonder sometimes whether we... I suppose there is a there is just an idea of where my thinking is. There is an old Latin tag. I think it's from St. Augustine, maybe St. Ambrose. Uh, the Lex Orandi Statui Legem Credenda. That the law of pr- the way in which you pray determines and establishes the way in which you believe. And to make it slightly more banal, the fiction that we watch establishes the moral values that we hold. Now, positively, what happened in Manchester in the aftermath of the Manchester bombing shows that that hasn't happened. But I do sometimes wonder whether popular culture plays a part, not so much for the likes of me or you, reasonable, intelligent, mod- you know, well-educated people as we are, but whether in the minds of those who are susceptible to it, it actually establishes an alternative morality. And I just wonder sometimes if we know what we're doing when we celebrate or try to excuse the negative. I mean, we're in the middle of an election campaign, and I'm not going to get involved in politics on this podcast because I, I don't think it has any place on a, a crafting podcast. And I'm, I, I'm aware that I've been talking for about 10 minutes on what is quite a heavy subject, but I didn't want this week to pass by without mentioning it. Our politicians are rightly, in my opinion, debating they're not debating particularly positively, but they are debating whether or not British domestic and foreign policy creates a, an environment in which acts like this can occur. And post hoc ergo propter hoc, after, therefore, because of, should be avoided. The fact that this individual has carried out this attack after the Iraq war after fighting against ISIS after the fall of Gaddafi his parents were Libyan exiles under Gaddafi there were refugees in this country he was born in this country he, the British helped to overthrow Gaddafi so British foreign and domestic policy, has it determined whether this boy would go on to do these terrible things? I think it's something we have to at least think about. And I'm, I, I don't have any answers. I really don't. I'm really just sharing thoughts on what has been a very difficult week, a terrible week, but also a, quite a bright week in terms of the response of Manchester and the country as a whole to such a terrible event. The support for the victims and their families, the support for the community as a whole, that we're not allowing this kind of action to prevent us from living the lives we 
want to live for ourselves and for our children, that we are not going to let these kinds of things divide communities. And insofar as I can play a part in that, I hope to play a positive part in that. But I, I just wanted to share some thoughts because I, they have been buzzing around inside my head and in some ways this, is a, <laughs> this podcast is a kind of opportunity for me to unburden some of those thoughts and, and maybe look at them at a distance by having them when I play them back to myself and then saying mm, maybe but maybe you've missed that little bit not everything I say in this podcast on the, the kind of heavier stuff it's not always a well formed thought it might have been a well formed thought that I now subsequently can see may have been wrong so nothing of what I say is set in stone but I, I'd just like to take this opportunity to maybe share some of the positives. And I think, you know, we have seen some significant positives in the last few days in Manchester. Um, and, you know, we can only hope that we can find some resolution to our international responsibilities that doesn't lead to these domestic difficulties as well. Um... On that note, then, I think I have, in fact, talked myself into a, a complete standstill. Uh, not quite. Um, I have tomorrow off work because it's a uh, spring bank holiday. Um, last bank holiday until the end of August. Um, and I was off on Friday, so I'm, I'm really enjoying having four days of um, time to relax and time to craft and time to learn the banjo um, and I hope to make some good use of it I'm probably going to go out tomorrow um, into Oxford for a short period to meet up with another friend and have a drink and a bite to eat with him and maybe uh, maybe even pop into Mason's if they're open hopefully they won't be open because it's bank holiday um, but that I do actually need to buy some backing material um, for the next quilt that I have in mind so I will need to pop into Mason's at some point for not to have a mooch but just for a specific project so I hands up now that's probably what I'll do um, so on that note I think I have run my course with this particular podcast um, if there is anything you want me to you want to say a comment on this video anything I've said in here if there is anything you want me to talk about in a future podcast um, please leave a message down below um, and until next time stay safe, stay healthy and enjoy yourselves <laughs>